that being said, uh, I just want to say a few words about to sort of set the stage uh, for the presentations tonight and this program. So um, we applied to a grant from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, focused on environmental justice, and we have been really concerned uh, around Newtown Creek. Obviously, the creek itself has all these long-standing environmental problems, right? The oil spill, the Superfund contamination, the ongoing sewage overflow issues, um, into the waterway itself, and our organization has been working for 20 years now, it's our 20th year, um, to try and, and fight for those improvements and fight for health in the communities as well. Um, we also have other issues that surround the community, uh, environmental challenges as well, things like air quality uh, that stem from some of the heavy industrial uses, the heavy tra uh, truck traffic uh, that's here as well. And, um, and of course, uh, urban heat island is, is a major issue for us. And like sewage overflow um, that is being um, made worse by increasing rainstorms, one of the impacts of climate change, like the uh, rising level of the creek itself, which is being uh, precipitated by uh, climate change impact as well, uh, urban heat island is a major, major issue uh, for, for many cities. Uh, and we see this every summer where there's major heat waves, whether it's in Europe or places that have never experienced uh, you know, 100 degree days, um, and specifically in the places around Newtown Creek, industrial zones, uh, which we'll hear about, um, that really suffer um, from having uh, mitigative impacts to, to help deal with, uh, with rising heat. So I'll stop saying more about that because that's what the presentation's about. Um, the, so we, this summer, we, this is the first of three years for this program. And uh, what we decided to do is each summer break up the creek into three different specific areas, uh, loosely focused on the industrial business zones, which are an actual sort of classification uh, for manufacturing industrial areas. And this summer we wanted to start with the uh, Long Island City um, industrial business zone uh, to focus in on. And we put out a call uh, over the summer for people to join this program as fellows. It's a six week uh, full time paid position and um, focused on people that have a direct relationship or interest, um, whether it's to the creek itself or specifically environmental issues like urban heat. And we had some really amazing applicants and uh, the group that we've had this year has been really, really awesome. Um, I wish that I personally, I'm sure Brendan and others in the office feel this way too, wish we could have spent more time uh, dealing with, you know, working with them and uh, hanging out on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's been, I'll just say personally, it's been really awesome uh, to see uh, the fellows here every day uh, working on all this stuff, and so um, really appreciate them. And of course, Laura, where did Laura go? Laura's running around making sure everything's right, but Laura has done, <laughs> there we are. Laura's just done a really fantastic job, so I just want to give a round of applause to Laura for. <laughs> for running this program scheduling field trips, finding ways to really bring all these complicated environmental issues um, in clear, transparent ways, engaging ways uh, with the fellows, and, uh, and so it's been really great. So thank you, Laura. So without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking here, and I'm going to pass the mic to uh, our first fellow, Shaw, uh, to give the first presentation. Oh, Tara. oh, Tara's going first. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I know, I know, sorry, I was, I was like, Chad's going first. Okay, so who's coming up? Tara's first. All right, okay, sweet. Here you go. Hi, everyone. My name is Natara Fletcher, and so my study was a green space study. So, what? Oh, higher? Okay. So I have the introduction, my methods and materials results, maps and graphs, discussion and conclusion. So each year the average global temperature is rising due to climate change. This rise in temperature results in higher rates of heat stroke, heat exhaust exhaustion, and death. The infrastructure of urban environments creates a unique microclimate which retains and emits heat. This is from the usage of dark and pervious materials like tar and asphalt and um, albedo roofs which, which uh, usually are low Oh, sorry, I made a mistake, but low albedo, <laughs> meaning that the surfaces aren't very reflective. Trees, green space, and buildings provide shadow, um, which also provides a cooling effect, which helps mitigate the impacts of the urban heat island effect. Um, 
but vegetative cover is less abundant in industrial areas. In hopes to mitigate the UHI effect, we canvassed around our site area of Long Island City and Sunnyside, cataloging various types of green space. So here's the infrared map showing the different heat points. So you can see like right at the, like the herbaceous layer or the ground layer, it's really, really cool due to the amount of trees, which provide a cooling effect with evapotranspiration um, and other stuff. And there are some green infrastructure projects, mostly in rain gardens being implemented, which help with uh, the runoff from rain and it absorbs a lot of the, the water that's coming through, which usually just like slides down due to uh, the non-porous pavement. So here is our site area. Originally, we were supposed to do it from up here, but we accidentally misread it and we have more data from up here. Uh, and here are some of the different drone areas that we um, highlighted. And yeah. So some of the materials that I used were iPhones Notes application, which I used, which I brought around each street and I cataloged all the different um, like trees and rain gardens and other stuff. We also used a drone, the DJI Mavic 2 Pro, to get into sites where we weren't really able to get into and to get like an above view of everything and also just to speed up the pro process of canvassing by rewatching these videos. We also used the Klein's tool infrared thermometer to read temperature. Uh, I used ArcGIS online to create a map, then Zola NYC to locate different businesses in the area and uh, for who owns certain buildings in the area. We also use Google Maps and Apple Maps and Google Sheets and Excel. So for my methods, we first, we cataloged all the street trees, rain gardens, dead trees, potential pollinator pathways, empty tree plots, and all the building trees in the area. And, and in the end, I only took data from the dead trees, potential pollinator pathways, and empty tree plots and I got all the longitude and latitude coordinates for that, uh, inputted it into Excel, and then I converted it into a CSV file and then uploaded that onto ArcGIS online. And here are some of, just some visuals of like, here are some potential pollinator pathways that just like empty plots of grass um, that could be seed bombed. And then here are just like empty, like tree, tree plots where a tree could be or should be, and some dead trees. And here, what a, here's what a rain garden looks like. So they usually have this dip in here, which allows the water to flow in. So for my results, um, so here, all, all in yellow are the empty tree plots. In blue are the potential pollinator pathways and dead trees. And then if I can, how do I? I could show you guys the interactive map I made. But yeah, so this is in our site area and I was able to map all these things out. And then let's go. So I'm gonna go back to the slide to talk about some of the findings in the map. And also here are some, if you can see here, here are some of the trees um, mapped out. I took this from uh, the New York City Street Map website and it just shows all the maps and you can see in the more industrial areas here, there's very, very little trees versus the more residential areas between 39th Street to 43rd Street. This will fly. Oh, and here's just some drone footage that we have. Looking over, oh yeah. This is right along the creek. As you can, you can see the map on the bottom here a little bit of the location. And in this area, we found a lot of trees and in our findings, we found out that a lot of the buildings in this area are actually closed. So 
that was just an interesting thing to know. So many blocks in the industrial areas had no trees at all. So there were a lot more dead trees in the residential areas. Uh, and in my findings, there was actually more potential areas for pollinator pathways in the industrial areas than the residential. Uh, we also interviewed the owner at City Auto Repair and Collision on 36th Street, and we asked what was limiting from putting more trees, and that is mostly for street parking or people parking on the sidewalk especially like leaving cars overnight for maintenance or repair. Uh, we also interviewed the owner at Iglesia Alianza Christian Y and said that the lack of the trees on the other side of, of the block caused a lot of like heat radiation to come to the other side. So in our conclusions, my hopes for the data is to hopefully this can be used by the next cohort to possibly seed bomb the areas and potent for pollinators uh, we also talked about the next cohorts possibly contacting the businesses that have tree plots on their property to get them to plant more trees. And we also, some other conclusions, um, or for the next cohort, maybe going over the data and noting more of the tree plots that need stump removal. I noted some, but it was like later in the study that I realized that was important. Uh, also, to make note of the little trees with only a little bit of leaves because some are, appear to be dying because I didn't really make note of that. I just made note of all the dead trees and with no leaves at all, but that's something that could be done um, or something that could be worked on. And also just making note of all the closed businesses around the, that drone footage area I showed you and possibly contacting them so, and talking about more creek access. And yeah, and that's the end of my Presentation. Hi everybody, I'm Sha. Um, I did a traffic study on Long Island City and Sunnyside, Queens. Um, so an overview, I'm going to kind of talk about our introduction, the methods and materials um, that I used for my drone study and my um, traffic study, my results, any maps and graphs, uh, discussion and conclusion. So, so a traffic study is an elaborative investigation on um, the transportation system in a specific area. So we kind of took that and um, I broke this area because I'm very familiar with the Long Island City area. I went to high school here at Long Island City, to Aviation High School. So um, kind of uh, previously knowing the roads and how they're laid out really helped with um, canvassing the area. So this is uh, the Pulaski Bridge. I chose um, the Pulaski Bridge as a traffic site and um, I sent the drone up there to see um, kind of breaking down what type of vehicular traffic in volume is coming into Long Island City and what type of vehicles in volume is going out of Long Island City. and. Um, so this is a truck route. So this is the New York City uh, commercial truck route, and Pulaski Bridge right here is a local truck route. And um, I sent the drone right above the Pulaski Bridge, right here, uh, between the creek. It's like right on top of the creek. All right. And I kind of talked about um, initially when I was trying to figure out how am I gonna. Uh, categorize the vehicles coming in and out of uh, Long Island City. It's a lot of vehicles, and if you look outside, it's just industrial. So you can kind of imagine what type of vehicles are going in and out. So my hypothesis was kind of there's more commercial vehicles and trucks going in and out of Long Island City um, through the Pulaski Bridge as a specific site area because um, it fell within our um, canvassing area as well. Um, so I broke it down into vehicle class. So this is also a, um, the Pulaski Bridge is right next to um, this blue area right here. Uh, I think Will has also kind of mentioned the industrial business zone. So these uh, zones are kind of 
collaborating with certain, uh, I think it's the city that kind of helps them uh, revitalize businesses in that area. And um, so I broke it down into uh, vehicle class. So common classes, which are passenger vehicles, um, then there's livery, taxi, and transport. And there's police, fire, and emergency, uh, military, veteran, and professional plates, which are like uh, medical doctors or podiatrists or anyone that has a special plate um, from the city of New York. But they're also categorized as passenger vehicles. And so the materials that I used, uh, also very similar to Tara's, um, this is my little guy right here. The drone helped us a lot. Um, we canvassed, I don't know how many thousand steps, um, and that drone saved us a lot. And it was really hot out in Long Island City. Um, you can just check for yourself. Go out for a walk on 47th Avenue and 29th Street. Take a walk. There's absolutely nothing on both sides of the street, and it's like a sauna, like a walking sauna. It's like a... <laughs> Um, so I broke it down uh, by the city's, uh, the DMV's registration code, which is PAS. Um, we'll, we'll kind of look into that. So PAS, um, uh, commercial trucks, motorcycles, hearses or funeral services, um, public service omnibus, and OMTs, which were taxis and medallions. So if you look at a car's registration, up here it shows you the registration class code, so you know what type of vehicle it is so, and what you're dealing with. Um, this is a kind of visual of what type of trucks go in and out of here and what class they are. So class one is a short vehicle, then short vehicle with towing is class two. It gets really, really crazy, so here's the visual. <laughs> um, so the methods that I used. Um, so I took the drone from the nature walk right here. Please check it out, it's really nice. The nature walk, right? Um, I took the drone out, I sent it out, and I put it above 40 meters above the Pulaski Ridge in the north direction, facing north, and I angled my camera to kind of get a full view of everything. You guys can see in a second. Um, so I chose one site. I chose um, two specific time intervals to uh, measure the volume of cars going in and out. So I chose 12 o'clock to 12.15. So 15 minute intervals, I kind of, um, took that and broke it into three segments, so three five-minute segments, and they were combined later, and I looked at the footage, and it um, recorded the traffic northbound and southbound, and I compiled that data to compare the vehicle uh, volume side by side. So this is kind of the, uh, right here, if you look right here, this is a tiny little green drone. That is where I would set the drone, and it would be facing in this way. Um, this is the Pulaski Bridge, you have Vernon here, Jackson Avenue there, the Long Island Expressway right underneath, and you have uh, Borden Avenue right here, running right underneath the Pulaski Bridge as well. A um, little history on the Pulaski Bridge, um, I looked into it, and it's a drawbridge, a lot of people don't know that, but it's a drawbridge, and uh, it's right over Nishan Creek, connecting Long Island City to Greenpoint, and on the Brooklyn side, there's McGinnis Boulevard, and on the uh, Queen side, we have uh, the Pulaski Bridge turns into uh, uh, 11th Street. And the bridge, over it passes over the LIE, and um, it has two 10.5 meter roadways. So 10.5 um, meters this way, going this way, and another one in the opposite direction. And one thing I really didn't notice until I checked on the zoom, uh, on the zoom, on the uh, drone footage, um, there's a bike and uh, pedestrian walkway there. So that also uh, brought an additional point into my traffic study and um, it brought a question to my head, like there's a lot of bikes and people walking on the border now, or uh, sorry, the Pulaski Bridge. Um, and why is that, right? This, oh. Yeah. 
so this is uh, what the footage looked like. The drone was really cool. It um, let us know our uh, distance, how far it was from me, and uh, 40 meters is the altitude. And um, yeah, so I kind of set it up here, left it for 15 minutes, and it recorded all of the you know, uh, vehicles coming in and out. So yeah, it was a lot of footage to look at, but even if 15 minutes is a short interval, it's a lot of vehicles coming in and out. Um, but yeah, that's that, and... So at the end, this was the first traffic studies that I did. Um, these are the, so I did a total of four traffic studies and studying both the direction going north and south. So northbound and southbound, so northbound would be um, entering LIC and southbound would be exiting LIC. And um, it was the Pulaski Bridge and the time interval. This traffic study one was at um, 12 to 12.15, so it's in the noon. Um, and kind of if you look at this, look at the uh, passenger vehicles versus the commercial vehicles. So that already kind of threw me off because I had an initial hypothesis like, yo, this is an industrial area with industrial trucks. You see it all the time coming in and out, but that makes no sense. But then I looked through the rest of the footage and that data was kind of, you know, solid throughout. And there was much more passenger cars than commercial vehicles and trucks using the Pulaski Bridge though. So some of the key challenges um, I had and I faced were with the drone, um, maximum altitude is uh, 115 meters in this airspace. I'll get into that. Um, the access, uh, there was a lot of physical barriers, high wind warnings. Um, it was just a little guy up there. And the wind was just beating it up because you know we're, it's in between a bunch of buildings and the wind is a little different up there. Um, nearby airports also um, created problems for us uh, due to range because this is a class Bravo airspace. We have three international airports in a 30 mile radius. So it's a busy airspace, we already know. So sending this little guy out into the busiest airspace in the United States is not um, first safe, but, and then second, birds and stuff. Yeah, that's, <laughs> they don't like the drone. But we didn't have as much trouble with the birds from what I've seen, yeah. Uh, the range, there was a 580 mile, uh, 585 meter range um, from where I was standing, even though it can go much farther. The problem was there was a lot of magnetic interference between the drone and controller and um, the drone. So I, like, it was pretty funny. Like, it would go a little far out of the bounds, and then it'll, like, freak out, and it'll, like, auto-return back to home. And like you can see it, I'm like, where's the drone? It's like coming back, it's like, I'm sorry. Um, then there was battery and storage. Uh, drones eat batteries and battery life. So I carried three extra batteries with us, a huge drone pouch. Um, and there was a limited 25 minutes of uh, recording every time because it records in 4K and 60 frames per second. So yeah, the footage is really nice to see, but really long to, like it takes long to open up, but you dealt with it. Um, another issue that I had was the NYPD uh, correctional facility right here and the uh, storage facility by Hogshead Ranch. Um, the drone shows it on the map um, as like a big red block and it'll go near it and then boop, 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 it'll come right back. Uh, it knows not to enter that zone because this is a restricted so, oh yeah, the drone knows all of the airport airspace, so that's how it knows that there's an airport nearby, don't go there. Um, and heat, that one was a very common one. High temperatures, our highest recorded temperature, Tara and I were walking on that street I mentioned, 29th and 47th, and um, this was right by it, Van Damme and 48th Avenue, 111.2 degrees Fahrenheit in the street like street level, not on the ground, not on the walls, not on the buildings, on the street. So if you don't believe it's real, go ahead and take a walk. 
<laughs> yeah, urban heat island is very real, and we're in it. So yeah, this was kind of the warnings that I got, the high wind velocity. Um, then there was the strong magnetic interference between the remote and also the geo zones, because New York City is mapped out in a weird way when it comes to airspace. Because if you go by the JFK airport and you send up the drone, you can't take it up more than 60 meters. So 60 meters, like where, by where I live, I can't take the drone up more than 60 meters because the airport's like right there. Out here, it's a little different, but there's a map and uh, the drone has it built in. So that really helped us a lot. Um, but yeah, discussion and conclusion, right? So there were more vehicles using the Pulaski Bridge to exit Long Island City at the time interval of 12 to 12.15. So passenger vehicles outnumbered commercial vehicles at that time. And more vehicles used the Pulaski Bridge to enter Long Island City at the time interval of 3 to 3.15. So like towards the afternoon, more vehicles are coming into Long Island City. Um, the number of commercial vehicles were significantly less than the private passenger vehicles. And the amount of bike traffic and pedestrian traffic was high on both sides of the Pulaski at both intervals. So I was able to see that. Um, but yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. Yep. I'm going to pass the mic off to Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Belair. Um, and like I said, I'm pretty new at all of this. Um, terrible at public speaking, and I'm also a first semester biology student, so science in general is new. Um, yeah, I, I just kind of like lucked my way into two internships this year, this summer, so I don't know. Um, so yeah, I'm 27. Uh, this is my, I'm going for my second degree. I have an associate's in marketing, so completely opposite field. Um, before this, I was doing an internship through LaGuardia, and NCA was our last stop on the sustainability tour throughout uh, Brooklyn and Queens. And I met Lore and told him about this uh, fellowship. And of course, I was very interested in that. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Uh, the way I was researching the urban heat island effect was by measuring the differences between green spaces and asphalt in what's currently available um, within Sunnyside and Long Island City. So basically the goal was to prove that creating more green spaces will lower the temperature, cool down the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, so materials were pretty limited. Um, my goal was pretty simple. Uh, I used an infrared dual laser thermometer, which was just used for surface temperatures on the soil and asphalt. And then I also was loaned um, from a professor who I think works here as well, uh, Holly. She loaned me a very expensive piece of machinery, the soil temperature and moisture reader. Um, and that came with different probes that you connect and you know, stick in the ground at different depths. Um, so yeah, I had chosen four sites within Sunnyside and Long Island City. I chose them because they were actually the only areas that had both asphalt and green anywhere. So, and that was pretty limited for most of it, like, I don't know, maybe 50 feet in total for each space, of green space. Um, and then within those four sites, I had different elements being studied. Uh, asphalt in the sun, asphalt in the shade, green spaces in the sun, and green spaces in the shade. Each site had 12 separate measurements for study. That was surface temperatures of pavement in the sun, pavement in the shade, green spaces in the sun, green spaces in the shade. And then each of those had three depths for what we could. We couldn't get below the asphalt, so we just had to stick with uh, surface temperatures. We talked for a bit about how to like crack through the pavement to you know, make everything kind of consistent, but it just wasn't doable. Um, and then, so yeah, so we, for the green spaces, we have three depths additionally. Surface, five centimeters, 10 centimeters, and 15 centimeters below. Um, and then also for the green spaces and not the asphalt, I was measuring moisture levels just to see if there was a correlation. Um, I was hoping maybe we could see, you know, if we have more moist green spaces, it'll cool down faster, the areas, but I, I saw no actual correlation in moisture and temperature. Um, so yeah, I, I visited each site 
once a day for what's that three weeks almost the 8th to the 23rd um, during the hottest time of day mostly which was 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. these are the four sites you can see here again mostly Sunnyside and Long Island City this is sort of just like an industrial waste area it's just like a mound of trash with some green on top of it next to the limousine company and the gas station um, this one is our most prevalent green space, which is Calvary Cemetery. Um, this one here is St. Raphael Church, right at the edge of the cemetery. And here is a pretty prominent um, apartment building, Celtic Park Apartments on uh, Sunnyside. So visited each of those once a day, doing about 12 measurements in total. And what I found was basically what I predicted, that the difference between the asphalt and the uh, green spaces would be pretty significant. And these were measured within a very close proximity. So I would go green space, asphalt, right next to each other. So the sunlight was the same, temperatures were the same, uh, conditions, moisture um, were pretty much all the same. And I thought that would prove the effect a lot more prominently. And it did. There was an average difference of about 4.2 uh, degrees Celsius, which is almost 40 degrees Fahrenheit, just with those different surface levels. Um, below the surface, the um, different depths, again, showed no real correlation uh, between each of the sites through all the study. The different depths really had no impact on the temperature, the cooling effect. Um, the other thing I measured was the difference in the sun and the shade areas instead of the asphalt and the green spaces. And again, there was an even more drastic change there, um, indicating that basically shade is the most important thing. Uh, even if you do have asphalt, you know, cover it, get trees in there. Um, the difference was 14.2 degrees Celsius, which was almost 58 degrees Fahrenheit. I think is pretty significant right next to each other. Um, yeah, so the hypothesis I think I proved pretty effectively. It was simple, um, the data was not, there was a lot of data to gather and a lot of it turned out to be not so helpful. So we learned a lot. Um, but yeah, the, the point was proved in our, our little few week study that we were able to you know, accomplish with what we had. And um, I think further study could expand on this data, making it a longer project. I know in a lot of science projects, not sort of like internships and fellowships, these scientists are out here collecting data daily for like years and compiling the data, figuring out different correlations for years and years. And then they publish that, and then a bunch of other scientists chime in to say what they think. It takes a very long time to get change done. So I'm hoping people can expand on this data, or at least just the concept that green spaces and shade can cool down the urban heat island effect, because it's pretty it's a pretty timely issue. Um, I'm not sure the exact number, but the temperatures are rising very quickly around the world, uh, but most prominently in the urban areas, especially ones that can continue to industrialize and develop at a fast rate like New York does. And without mitigation efforts, like cities like Singapore, for instance, who actually build with the intention of being sustainable so they don't have to deal with this problem the way we do. Um, so I think New York could learn from that. We're a very progressive city, a very progressive state. It shouldn't be that difficult to get things done. Um, but I'm hoping local city, state, and federal government can choose to meet the challenge of adapting our cities because it will be pretty uninhabitable in the future. Um, the other point, it was a little side note, the average cumulative difference um, between shade and light and green spaces and asphalt, between those, the difference was 9.2 uh, Celsius, 48, almost 49 degrees Fahrenheit. So it kind of tells a bit of combined aspects of both of those spaces. Um, again, I think I already told you that the deeper into the soil really had no 
uh, correlation to the project. And that's it. Thank you. Oh, hello. Thank you so much for coming. I will be the last presentation today. My name is Yasmin Wilkerson, and I'm part of the Newtown Creek Alliance. So, <laughs> hopefully they save the best for last. I don't want to take my own horn. But so, we've been doing some research upon the urban heat island effect. So let's visit that. What is the urban heat island effect? So it's defined as an urban or metropolitan area that is significantly warmer compared to its rural areas close by. So this may happen due to human activity and intervention and sometimes that can look like industrialized zones. Sometimes that can look like excessive car usage and pollution. So these cities that are in these industrialized zones are proved to have higher temperatures compared to rural areas. Down here, this is a combination of data that I collected and data that I got from a news source about like their average temperature data within the Sunnyside LIC area. So I found out that within the six sites that I visited, the data temperatures that I collected were five degrees hotter compared to our rural temperature areas. Insane, insanely hot. And just like Shah said, if you don't believe it, you can walk out on the street. <laughs> so air quality. I want to, I, my focus was looking into urban, the urban heat island effect and temperature variance and how air quality impacts that. So what is air quality? It's the degree to which ambient air, ambient as far as like the air up in our immediate area, that's what that means. It's the degree to which the ambient air is pollution free and it's assessed by a number of uh, indicators. So first, I'll actually come back to that, but I actually want to skip and identify to how are we identifying our air? How is our air quality monitored? Does anybody know? So the air quality index, or the AQI, is the EPA's index for reporting air quality. If you don't know what the EPA is, it's the Environmental Protection Agency, and they're in charge of doing a lot of amazing things for this earth. So when it comes to the air quality index, they use five major air pollutants to make sure that, our, that we can monitor our air quality. So what are those five pollutants? It's the ground level ozone, which is the combination of nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds. It's particle pollution, and sometimes you might know that as particulate matter, also known as PM2.5 or PM10. It also looks like carbon monoxide, which I feel like is very familiar to everybody. We all have carbon monoxide alarms. We all know about that one. And sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide. These are the five air pollutants that are measured and used to help monitor how our air quality is. And that is act this is actually the, uh, the meter that the EPA uses so that the general population can know about air quality. So why is this important? Why should we monitor something that we can't even see? Because it affects our cardiovascular systems, because it may cause carcinogenic effects, because it may, because people that are immunocompromised might have hard problems maneuvering within uh, places of poor air quality. So it is super important. Other, uh, it might also cause like a wide range of health issues like allergies, bronchi bronchitis disease, vision problems, and blood problems as far as like the mental uh, development of children, which is super important. So the most vulnerable to poor air quality are pregnant women, the elderly, people that are immunocompromised, and children. So let's let's go back. We already know about what is air quality and how it's <laughs> and how it's monitored, but what how does it look like? When it comes to poor air quality, sometimes, if not often, if you have poor air quality, you will see something develop that's called a haze. So these pictures display that and how on a good day within um Within Seattle, within 2018, this is an actual picture of Seattle, there has been uh, sites of clearness, no haze, and good air quality versus after a wildfire where there's a lot of smoke, a lot of haze, a lot of inhalants that can affect your lungs. So this haze is caused when sunlight occurs in, in uh, 
you go back. So this haze <laughs> occurs when sunlight tries to go through these particles and interacts with them. So unfortunately, they don't go right through the air. They have to go through these particles, and sometimes they might be absorbed within the light. So the more particles in the air, the more scattering and absorption of the light to reduce the clarity and the colors of what you see. So this beautiful horizon, you won't see it, unfortunately, because the air quality is poor. We have got to focus sometimes on the things that we can't see because it might just be as important as the things that we can. So up and out, went out onto my site. So I chose six sites, uh, six Creekside access sites around the, the LIC Sunnyside area. Um, as you can see, these sites were more green-like. So I wanted to have a uh, balance between sites that were immediately in industrialized zones that were surrounded by factories. And I wanted to compare those, te uh, those temperatures to spaces that were still Creekside assets, assets, creek access sites, but were a little bit more green and had a lot more lush vegetation. So what was the data discovered? And I'm so proud of myself, guys. This is all the data that I collected. Ah! <laughs> but, but yeah, um, so this is a, uh, is a comparison between the average air temperature that I collected near the Creekside sites. And when you step out of the site, maybe I'm in a parking lot. Maybe, maybe so for some of these sites, it's hard to get towards the creek. That's why it's called Creekside access sites. So not everybody has that access. So for a lot of the general population, we have access to the sidewalk outside. So I found out that a lot of the air temperatures from the sidewalk were significantly three to five degrees higher than creek access based sites. So referring back to the historical air temperature in the first graph, I mean in my first uh, page, although these are creekside access sites near water, which are expected to be you know, uh, a little bit cooler, the overall temperatures of the LIC Sunnyside area was still two to three degrees lower than the recorded daily temperature. So we are hot. We are hot in here, and we have to make sure that this, that this issue is a known issue, that we all know about this and that we all do our part to make sure that air, our air quality is being uh, assessed and taken care of. So I would just like to go back to these sites and point out that um, at first I was going, I chose these sites at first because I wanted to do research upon water quality. But unfortunately, because of the resources and our time constraint, I wasn't able to do that. Fast forward, I tried to change this, my problem or what I was researching into air quality and get an air quality monitoring instrument. Yet again, resources and time constraints didn't allow me to do that. So I also want to point out, which will also be in our final presentation, about uh, just the challenges that we face as young community re uh, researchers, that sometimes when it comes to funding for places like Newtown Creek Alliance, it is needed. It is highly needed. We need funding to make sure that we can properly do this research. And if not us, if not community scientists, then help support the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Help to fund super fun sites that might need a little bit more help as far as remediation. So there is just a lot going on here and there's a lot of support needed by just our very own citizens right in front of me. So what is our conclusion? What did I find out and how can we look forward to making a cleaner future? So the impact of our land use and its changes is an important parameter for local air quality estimation. What does that mean? So in industrialized specific zones like the LIC Sunnyside area, it's highly suggested that lessening our usage of vehicular um, travel, like lessening our usage of gas powered vehicles and toxic gases emitted from local factories that will help to reduce air, air pollution. So other types of general everyday land usage that impacts our air can look like reducing or eliminating fireplace and wood stove usage. I know some of y'all love to cook, love to keep that stove on. Let's make sure we monitor that. So let's avoid burning leaves, trash, and other materials. 
And let's avoid using gas-powered lawn and especially our agricultural equipment, especially. Even with just using fertilizers on such a large scale, that could have such a crazy impact on our air quality. So, in, conclu in conclusion, reducing the overall effects of climate change can help tackle our air pollution issue. So, I also found that heat waves often lead to poor air quality, and the extreme heat and stagnant air during a heat wave can lead to uh, soil impermeability, meaning that the soil won't be able to absorb the water. It'll actually evaporate even more because of the heat wave. And that will allow for a lot of the air quality to remain stagnant and for that air pollution to stay. So just going back to what I said, and as far as like the urban heat island effect and how that is impacted through air quality, if we reduce our poor, if we reduce uh, our impacts to air quality, our negative impacts to air quality, and replace that with more ecological friendly solutions, then we'll all be breathing better. We'll all be feeling better. Our children will be better. Our future will be better. So, thank you so, so much for coming. <laughs> Hopefully I woke y'all up. And I, I definitely, back to what I said as far as support, I hope that the work that we've done and the research that we've done can help uh, other future community researchers to pick up this work and to start where we left off. So thank you so much. I hope that y'all are all feeling inspired as far as the different types of sciences and subjects that we've gone into. And yeah, please enjoy the space. Enjoy, learn, live. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> All right, so some challenges that we had um, were lack of access to phones and Wi-Fi and laptops to work on the project outside of fellowship hours. Also, the reliance on batteries in the field. Oftentimes, my phone just, I had to go back here because I had to charge my phone and I didn't bring a portable charger. <laughs> and that limited how much data I could collect some days. Uh, some just physical barriers and lack of public access. So the drone footage I showed you guys earlier Overviewing along the creek, we wouldn't be able to access that by foot because it's private private property, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but with the drone, we were able to get to those areas, which you know, very fortunate that Shaw has that technology. Uh, some outside obligations, at least in my case, I am a student at LaGuardia Community College right nearby, and I was walking to and from. I had a summer class, and I was walking to and from LaGuardia and here. So I can, you know, do this internship and also, you know, finish up. Ooh, can I study. add on to that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as far as outside obligations, I think that that points out something really important that it's that it's it's imperative to work as a team, or to have a team or somebody that can pick up your slack when those outside obligations come in. Yes, and one thing that I faced was street harassment when I was out canvassing, especially when I was out alone in these industrial areas and. I think because there's not a lot of people in these areas, I think a lot of men maybe feel like they can say more things because not a lot of people are around to uh, witness them. And even when I was with Shaw, uh, people would still say stuff. And this definitely like impacts like at least my ability to go out into the field and feel safe to do research like this. Um, another takeaway was also Field work and high temperatures and staying hydrated was yeah. really difficult. <laughs> At some points, we just had to come back here because it was way too hot. Like when we recorded the 111 degree temperature that day, it was at the hottest point in the summer. I think it was, uh, at least on my phone, it was like 96 degrees. But if you looked at the field real temperature, it was 104. And then in these industrial areas, it's even more. It was like that whole weird heat wave that we had a couple weeks yeah. ago. Yeah. And also just physical pain. Uh, I know at least in my case, traveling to and from LaGuardia with my backpack and my laptop uh, caused a lot of shoulder pain um, and that like radiating to different sides and also just uh, getting the monkeypox vaccine and having to carry things around still and deal with that pain um, after that was also difficult. And then I don't know how to turn this. Hmm. I shouldn't talk about speed break groups. Oh, I mean, I Oh, that was already about to. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And I guess that's it. Yeah. Uh, I guess any questions for us? Questions.
Last one. Uh, I, I will say that that was a contribution by one of our other team members. So I, I don't think we, I don't think any of us feels uh, comfortable speaking upon that. But we've kept it up there because it's a, it's her valid um, opinion. It's her valid statement. Any questions? About any of our stuff. I forgot to ask for questions. No. Any questions within traffic related things, within air quality, within water?